Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to our to, is this on? to our very last Comic Fest item on the program. It's been so nice to have everyone here today. I think we've sort of done our sums, and we've we've had close to a thousand people come through the doors today. So it's been a really successful day. We've really appreciated everyone's support. Um, it's been so great to have you all here. I'd love to introduce this next panel. Um, we've called it Perspectives on the Cartooning Life, but really it was a, a, an opportunity to have a whole lot of really interesting, fascinating people with a lot of diverse interests join together and talk about the thing they love the most. In case of an emergency, you make your way out of the building, uh, turn right onto Aiken Street, and then turn left and head towards the vacant lot. If there's an earthquake, you assume the brace position. And finally, look for staff. And staff um, have these very handy Comic Fest lanyards. And I got that down to three sentences. It's really nice to have you all here. And I'd like to um, introduce Dylan, who will introduce the panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Monty. And um, I just want to to say really clearly how marvellous this event is and how um, I'm very, very grateful. I'm sure a lot of us are very grateful to everyone involved in organising it, um, including particularly Monty and Hannah, uh, who chaired the previous session, um, both of whom really had to step up after the Wellington Central Library was uh, closed, which I'm sure we're all mourning at the moment. Um, because of earthquake issues. Uh, so they had to very quickly find a new venue, and they did. And it's been a fantastic event. So thank you, Monty and Hannah. Maybe a quick round of applause for the organisers. <laughs> so my name's Dylan Horrocks, and I'm a cartoonist. I feel like I'm at an AA meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the cartooning life. The <laughs> um, and I, I've been... I've been addicted to comics most of my life, <clears throat> and making them pretty much most of my life. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here chairing a discussion with three really, really exciting New Zealand cartoonists. Um, at this end, we have Mikhail Milipola, who is also known as Liger, the wrestler. Um, Mikhail uh, has been drawing comics for a long time, uh, and I think the first time I saw your work was probably in Newground, uh, which was in the early 2000s, published by Gotham Comics in Auckland, where Mikhail also worked. Um, and, and, and you've continued working in comic shops, uh, now working in Arkham City Comics in Auckland, which you helped, helped open. Um, and in addition to that, Mikhail also is a professional wrestler. Uh, wrestling for Impact Pro Wrestling, and now you said now that you're uh, also involved in running the wrestling. Um, yeah. Uh, yep. um, I'm the director of the promotion now, so I'm the boss of <laughs> New Zealand Wrestling. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is why I've been a former tag team champion and former New Zealand heavyweight champion. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That's um, what it yeah. takes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, back to comics. Um, Mikhail has uh, has produced a whole series of comics about wrestling for Boom, uh, the WWE wrestling comics series, and also a series of graphic novels called Headlocked since 2012, um, and uh, has also illustrated uh, a series of books for Reading Warrior books, um, exploring uh, Samoan heroes, Cook Island heroes, and Tongan heroes among other topics. Um, and uh, in 2011, I just want to note, uh, Mikhail was one of the top 25 finalists in the Stan Lee Foundation Creator Superhero Competition. Uh, maybe you can just briefly tell us what that was like. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, was, that was fun. I, I created a character called uh, the Custodian, uh, who was a teacher by day and superhero by night. Because... Um, uh, it was essentially he was saving kids in the classroom as a like as a teacher and then saving um thing it was yeah it was it was a real stupid idea really um it was just one of those mistakes that kind of went too far 
and next thing I know, I'm a finalist. Um, but that's kind of my career. <laughs> um, a, a mistake yeah. that went too far. <laughs> Welcome to the cartooning yeah. life. Yeah, <laughs> see, 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 these guys understand. It's just, it's just you, you have a silly idea, you, you flesh it out, and next thing you know, people like it. You're like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it was, that, was, that was fun to do. Um, I explored the idea of the, the custodian. He gained his superpowers um, because a superhero kind of landed on him, uh, creating some uh, wreckage. And um, so he was cut open, he was hurt, and the, the, the blood of the superhero had kind of, um, kind of uh, infected him. And so that's how he got superpowers, by getting crushed by a superhero. Um, so yeah, so that was, it was yeah again it was real silly, uh, and I made the finals and I was just like okay cool, uh, that's a thing. Um, so yeah. Well, one of the many exciting things that the cartooning life brings us is moments like that. Um, all right, and next to Mikhail is Sharon Murdoch, who I kind of feel like you don't really need any introduction. <laughs> <laughs> No, I feel like Sharon Murdoch does not really require any introduction, especially in Wellington. Um, uh, I Can I say this? I, I know a lot of political cartoonists in New Zealand and there's a lot of really great ones, but um, at the moment, Sharon's my favourite. I feel like she's doing extraordinary cartooning and there are very few people in the whole world of political cartooning who are doing work as interesting as hers. Um, and I'm not the only one who thinks that because Sharon, uh, when she started doing political cartooning in newspapers in, in around 2013, was that? Uh, within a year, she was nominated for the Canon Media Award for being the best cartoonist in New Zealand. The following year, she was nominated again. And then she had a straight run of three years where she won the award. Um, this year was a bit of an oddity. I'm not quite sure who the jury was this year, but she wasn't nominated. <laughs> which and, and Toby Morris wasn't either. And neither was Toby Morris. So we won't say anything about that. <laughs> but, but we can ignore that strange blip <laughs> this year. Um, clearly, Sharon is sweeping the awards mostly <laughs> consistently. Um, <laughs> awards. Well, yeah, I don't know what. Anyway, um, Sharon's of Naitahu and English descent. Um, and... I love this story that when she was at school, uh, the tech drawing class was only boys and it required Sharon's father to uh, intervene with the principal to have her allowed to join the tech drawing class. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. They said I wasn't allowed in because I obviously just wanted to be around the boys. <laughs> was that true? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they, were, they were particularly unappealing, do <laughs> And um, and setting setting a pattern for the rest of her life, having finally busted into the boys only class of tech drawing, Sharon went on to win the school prize. <laughs> so and one could At say South and Tech. So you know that was their specialty. <laughs> right, um, and uh, went on to become a, a graphic designer, including working for a while in the Wellington Media Collective, uh, which had a very big impact in. Um, in the graphic design world in New Zealand for quite a while. Uh, and, um, and did volunteer service abroad in South Africa, including co-drawing a comic. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, I was working in East London and in a township called Imdinsane. And um, they, I don't know, VSA, volunteer service abroad, they advertise jobs in New Zealand that have been described by the organisation in the country. So, you know, you kind of um, apply for a position and they were looking for someone to work on educational material around AIDS education, prevention, and also early childhood education. And this was a Kosa Women's Community Development Group. And um, when I arrived there, I was working with a woman called Nalundi Cooper, who is truly amazing. But we would, um, in the end, we we were originally going to do video, but it was that was their idea. But because most of the places that information was going into didn't have power, we then changed to printing these comics. And I mean that that was really neat. We we tried to produce them um, so that people didn't have to be able to read because a lot of the people who were looking at this information. 
couldn't read. And that, that alone was very interesting for me. I had kind of thought, in a very ignorant way, that images were universal. And then I found out that they really weren't, that the culture that you're working within is, um, we have a very different reading. So I had been put in touch with the Grahamstown University and Rhodes, um, the Rhodes University, Grahamstown. And there was a guy there who had done a lot of work around Central Africa, sort of Southern Africa, around um, visual language, really. But the things that came out of that were really fascinating. Like he had, you know, images of people being told to wash their hands, but the hands were shown detached from bodies and people being really alarmed by it, that, you know, why would you be washing these amputated hands? <laughs> you know? So, um, but it was a great thing. I learned a lot. I think I learned a lot more than Nilandi did working with me. So, um, so Sharon's cartoons are regularly seen these days in the Dominion Post, uh, both her editorial cartoons and also Munro the Cat who is a favourite on the crossword page and has been. When did you start doing Munro? Oh, quite a while, a long time. Long, long time. time, we won't need to work out when. <laughs> but there, there's just been a, a book uh, published collecting the Munro cartoons, which I warmly recommend, um, along with also uh, there is a book that came out a few years ago by, um, by uh, about Sharon's cartoons, her political cartoons, which is... Um, actually edited and put together by a former, a former librarian from this very library, Linda mm. Johnson, and yeah. that's um, that's published by Pot and Burton as well. Mm. So um, thank you, Sharon, you and did. Roger, Roger Langridge, um, who's visiting from the UK but is originally from New Zealand, from West Auckland, like me. <laughs> um, in fact, the first time I met Roger was sometime in the 1980s when we were both pretty fresh out of high school. We're from the 80s, yes. We yeah. are from the 80s. We have both beamed in from the 80s. Um, and even back then, the first time I met Roger, um, I was shown one of his little mini-comics. He'd, he'd published a photocopy mini-comic and immediately thought, holy crap, I wish I could draw like that. <laughs> and... Um, and he was like a, a, about a year younger than me, so that just made it worse. <laughs> and, um, and then he got out a notebook to write down my contact details, because we didn't know a lot of comics people, any of us in Auckland. Yes. It was very exciting to meet other comics people. Um, but he got out his notebook to write down my contact details, and instead of just grabbing a pen and scrolling it down, he took out a, a rotring technical drawing pen. If anyone remembers those, they would leak ink everywhere, they were crazy. <laughs> But he got that out and carefully hand-lettered my contact details exactly like the lettering you see in his comics. And I said to him, what, good God, do you write that, that <laughs> What the hell the are you doing? Yeah, what are you, what are, you, are you mad? <laughs> so I, I said, what are you doing? And what did you say to me? Um, something along the lines of, um, well, I, I want to do this for a living and if um, I take every possible opportunity to letter is the way I would... Uh, in a comic book, then I'll be good, really good at it. Um. And that's when I knew this guy would go far. And and indeed, he, he did go far. He went all the way to England. <laughs> Can't go further without sending me to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> and along the, way, along the way, his comics also went far. He was published by Fantagraphics um, when you... God, you must have still been... Were you still a teenager when you were published mm, by... No, uh, th that came out the end of 1989, so I was 22. 22, yeah. okay, old, old by then. Yeah. Um, so he was published by Fantagraphics in the US uh, very, very quickly. And uh, since then has been published by just about everyone. Um, he's drawn comics for Boom. He's, he's written work for Marvel, drawn work for Marvel. Yep. Uh, DC, worked for DC. All this means is I can't hold down a job. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who... Uh, he's drawn characters, drawn and written characters like Popeye, Mandrake the Magician. Um, he's he won awards for his Muppet Show comic, uh, and uh, has written Thor: The Mighty Avenger. Um, those of us in New Zealand probably uh, are, are fondest of his characters: Fred the Clown, uh, Knuckles the Malevolent Nun, which he created with 
Cornelius Stone. How many people here know Knuckles the Malevolent Nun? That's quite a few. A few survivors from the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. W once you've seen Knuckles, you won't forget her. <laughs> so I did a I did a page for one of the anthologies of Knuckles as well, and I was like, yes, I get to draw Knuckles. <laughs> Knuckles. Knuckles is a legend, <laughs> a horrible, terrifying legend that haunts our nightmares. A dirty icon. <laughs> um, but Roger's also known for his, his comic Snarked, uh, which was a strange personal twist on the Lewis Carroll universe. Uh, criminy and is currently also reviving his series Zoot which was an absolute favourite for quite a few years from Fantagraphics and is now self-publishing his new version. He's won or been nominated for multiple awards including the Eisners, the Harveys, an Ignatz Award and the National Cartoonist Society Award which many people know as the Rubens, but there's only really one of those awards is officially known as the Rubens. Yeah. So we'll say it's an NCS <laughs> award, yeah. but we know it's really a Ruben. It was a nomination. It'd be nice to get one, but yeah. Yeah. nominations are good too. So yeah. that's our stellar lineup of guests here. Um, and the first question I want to ask, we've sort of gone into a little bit, but I want to ask each of you, um, what was your pathway to the cartooning life? What, what led you to take it? Why and how did that play out? So maybe we'll start with Mikhail. Uh, yeah, so I fell in love with comic books uh, before I started school. Um, my uncles collected comics, so um, just as a young kid who loved doodling, um, finding comics at the age, I just wanted to draw comics. Um, you know, stuff like ROM, The Space Knight, uh, X-Men, 2000 ADs, just anything. Like, I'd go to the dairy and whatever comics they had, even if it was Blue Devil, I will just buy it because it was comics. Like, it was like, I just want, I just want yeah. Um, you know, even Marvel Spotlights, you know, even though it was all more words than comics, it was like, oh, this is comics in my, in my mind. And, um, yeah, and so one of the things that um, I loved about comics, especially as a kid, was that I grew up in Mangere. I'm, I'm a South Auckland boy. And uh, South Auckland has a bad rap, uh, and kind of rightfully so. But um, but comics kept me occupied. Um, so I was too busy exploring my own mind rather than the streets um, and getting into trouble. Um, so the comics essentially kind of saved me a, uh, a life of uh, of uh, bad stuff, really. Um, and it was just something I always did. Uh, I drew I drew in uh, art. Drew in English, drew in science, drew in maths. <laughs> Eventually drew in detention because I was drawing in those other classes. But, um, but you know, it was, it was just something that just, just always felt like me. Um, even as a long-haired kid, I used to have long hair. Um, uh, while all the other cool kids were playing kiss and catch, I was too busy reading comics and drawing. Um, so it was just something I knew was, was me. Uh, and... Um, I felt like I needed to give it the best shot I could, um, and somehow it worked out. Um, like everything else, you know. So I was like, oh, I'm just gonna give it a shot. You no, know, it's just I'll take the person. And next thing you know, oh, I'm kind of successful. Uh, how, <laughs> how did I find myself here? Um, so yeah, so yeah, just comics have just been an integral, I guess, anchor point throughout my whole life. Uh, something I can always focus on. Um, and I understand a lot of young people don't have that. Um, so yeah, so comics just a big part of my life, integral uh, to my growing up, and um, somehow I just found myself here as a guest at Comic Fest. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up at the other end of the country, in Invercargill, which is. Um, and I can't remember, apart from I had an uncle, I think, who read war comics, which I was fascinated by, but I couldn't quite make out what was going on. Um, I don't think I saw any comics at all. I, I saw, there used to be a little comic ran in the, it wasn't even a comic, it was, what do they call them? Um, gag panels, you know, the lovers. There used to be, you know, lovers? That was the first thing I saw. I remember thinking, I could draw that. <laughs> I mean, they were outrageously simple things you know and they were also nude and this is in the <laughs> <laughs> in the 1970s which is quite peculiar but I didn't I think drawing was a solace you know at a time 
that, like, I grew up in a household, my father had bipolar disorder and it was really tumultuous childhood. And so drawing, it was something to be completely absorbed in it and that was my own. And, um, and it probably helped that the first time, you know, and they talk about children, the first time they feel really seen by someone. And um, I think the first time I really felt seen was by my art teacher when I got to high school. And I was, I think it was in the fifth form, and I had this amazing art teacher, Jim Gilmore. And it was like he recognised something in me and... I don't know, it was the best, it was just the best experience, you know. And so I, I carried on drawing and then I got into design school. And this is living in, I don't know, anyone knows in Vicargo here, this is like south in Vicargo, which is, um, it's sort of the poorer side of Vicargo. And I didn't go to school with anyone who went on to any kind of tertiary education. And um, I got into design school, I did design and... After I left there, I did like illustration, but I was more interested in the design side. Then I became designer for the City Art Gallery and um, did stuff like VSA, and I worked with Wellington Media Collective as a sort of was an activist design group and a place where I felt very comfortable. And, um, and then I worked in newspapers, which suited me well because it was around that time I had a daughter, so it was I could work my life around you know, having my child and doing my work and that sort of thing, um, and carried on doing design. But then I got into my early 50s and I realised that design wasn't the thing that drove me anymore. You know, I didn't... I could see it and I could look at beautiful work and think how wonderful it was, but previously it had been something, you know, I'd go to bed with a book beside the bed, like a notebook, so I could jot down ideas and I wasn't doing that anymore and um but during this period I had lived with a cartoonist um I'd lived with a guy Trace Hodson who was political cartoonist for the listener and he always used to say to me oh why don't you try political cartooning but the trouble was he was so good you know <laughs> that any effort I made looked kind of pathetic so I didn't I didn't even venture into that area. But what it did do is he ended up introducing me to a whole lot of comics that I had never seen. So we did look at a lot of underground comics, you know, they were always around the house. And I think that was my first, you know, in my mid-twenties was my first introduction to Hergé, which I was a bit shocked by, I must say. I mean, I remember saying to Trace, what is this with this comic? There's no women in it. The only <laughs> one in here is... What is her name? Bianca Castiforo. Yeah. yeah, there's no other woman. And he said, yeah, isn't it great? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but so then I had been drawing at the newspaper as a way to entertain myself. I started doing kind of political illustration for stories and <coughs> then Tom Scott went on leave for six months and sort of it was quite... A saga, but eventually they let me have a go at drawing political cartoons. So that's what I'm doing now. The rest of his history. I just want to note that um, Love Is uh, was drawn by a New Zealander, yeah. a New Zealand woman who, who I think, I mean, she was living overseas by the time she did that cartoon, but um, she's possibly, <coughs> possibly one of our most successful cartooning exports. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was hugely, hugely successful in the 1970s. Roger. Yes, um, how I came to comics. Uh, well, I, I, I sort of learnt to read from comics. I mean, I, I was certainly looking at them before I could read. Um, uh, we, we'd sort of go on long car journeys, my brother and I, with my mum. And, um, you know, brothers fight, so to stop us fighting, she'd throw comic books at us in the back seat. And, <laughs> Um, it was Walt Disney's comics, you know, Karl Barks comics, Uncle Scrooge and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and I, I sort of taught myself not quite to read, but I, you know, got halfway there just by looking at the pictures and putting the words together. Um, and uh, at school, uh, when, when I, when I think that sort of my 
a moment of epiphany, really, when I decided that that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, I was about six or seven, and we had a teacher who um, gave us uh, an assignment to draw a comic strip, like you know, like a newspaper strip. And we were given this piece of paper that was sort of in the shape of a newspaper strip, and the idea was that you'd do your three or four panel comic strip. Um, and so everybody in the class was doing their strips, three or four panels, and I did like 16 panels on one side of the paper, then turned it over and did the other side of the paper. I, I don't know why, but I'd found my thing. It was just, it, it just seemed like the most natural thing in the world to spend the rest of my life doing that. I don't quite know what, I must have been in a very strange place as a kid. I don't know, but, and I'm sure it wasn't healthy to fixate on that for the rest of my life, but, but that's what I did. Um, so I just, you know, never really had a plan B from that point on. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, school and everything was, I was just counting the days until I could be a cartoonist. Um, so I read lots and lots of comics, I drew a lot, I just, you know, tried to absorb as much knowledge just from copying and, and studying these things as I could. I read a load of comic history books. I I thought that that was, you know, the way to unlock the secrets of cartooning was to find out where it had all come from. Um, go back to first principles and find this sort of the perfect genesis of the cartoon form or something. I don't know. Um, did Did you find it? Still looking. Um, uh, yeah, I've got some stuff down the back of the sofa. I'm going to check afterwards. Um, it, it'll be out there somewhere. The perfect proto comic, somewhere on a cave wall, probably. Um, but yeah, I I just uh, kept doing this. Um, with the intention of making it my career. Um, and because New Zealand didn't have a comic industry and because there were people making a living from cartooning, but you could count them on one hand and it wasn't really the kind of cartooning I, wa I wanted to do, um, I decided, that I, I figured out that I would have to go somewhere where they had a comic industry in order to earn a living at it. And that meant in the English speaking world, either America or Britain. Uh, and there was a sort of established path uh, for people to go to Britain to become cartoonists from New Zealand. Murray Ball had done it. Um, Colin Wilson had done it. Uh, you did it before I did. Um, so it, it was sort of like the way you did it. So that's that's what I did. I, I After I left university, I got the first terrible job I could get, which was the Inland Revenue. Um, LAUGHTER uh, I, I told my father I was working for the Inland Revenue, and he said, you don't know me, I was, you were raised by wolves. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so I, I worked at that for a year, just saved every penny and bought a plane ticket to London and, and uh, you knocked on doors until I, I got paid work. Um, and I, it's, it, there's been peaks and valleys since then, but I've been basically doing it ever since. You're still drawing those pant those multiple panels on the s the back of that that little piece of paper your teacher gave you basically yeah. still going yeah. uh, i haven't found the end of the paper yet yeah <laughs> um i wanted to ask you roger um w when you i mean as you say you felt that you had to leave new zealand to to have a career in cartooning but what's it like now coming back to new zealand all these years later and seeing the comics landscape in New Zealand today. You've just had a whole day of watching other younger cartoonists talking about. Yeah, um, well, it's, I, I guess I'm the last generation who would ever have had to do that um, because the internet came along and it made the world much smaller for the kind of thing I want to do. Um, so it, it, there's been, um, for quite some time now, it's been possible to stay in New Zealand and work with publishers on the other side of the world and not have to just, you know, ship your art, physical artwork off and hope for the best. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously a very fertile time. There's huge, a huge amount of activity here. There always has been, but now some people are actually making a living at it and that's, you know, really wonderful. I, and occasionally, you know, I think, should I come back? Um, it's, it's not going to happen for lots of reasons, at least not in the immediate future, but um, uh, it, it, it's reached the point where I could if I wanted to, you know, which um, I didn't think would ever happen. And, and Sharon, um, you know, political cartooning has also changed enormously over the years. 
and yet in New Zealand it, it felt for a long time as though it hadn't. It was the same people doing it who'd been doing it in the 1970s and they still the cartoons generally sort of looked the same and, and felt the same. But at the same time, as, as Paul Diamond mentioned in the previous discussion, newspapers were closing and space was disappearing and there was a lot of pressure on it. You came into political cartooning while all that was really kind of happening. Mm. How do you feel the internet is, is the internet digital media, the, the change in newspapers, how do you feel like that's shaping the work that you do and the, the field that you're working in? Um, I think with people like Toby Morris coming along, who's doing remarkable work and is linked to mainstream media, but, you know, longer form, um, I don't know what you call it, a graphic, kind of graphic journalism, but also comment. And, um, I can see that opening up. Actually, I should mention this to anyone who's here who's interested, as I know that stuff, because I work as part of the Stuff Media Group, um, they have been looking for some time for people who are able to do those, like the style of work that Toby is doing. So, you know, if anyone's got anything, they should contact Patrick Crudes in there, who's the editor-in-chief of Stuff. Um, for for me, I I mean, I am still working, drawing on paper. I do a lot of work also on digital media, um, and work goes up online. Um, so for me, it probably hasn't affected it that much. I'm not sure. That, I think there's going to be changes probably coming up because of... Um, this probably isn't very interesting to many people here, but it's <laughs> interesting to me... Um, the, the Herald in Auckland has just put up a paywall and one of the interesting things they've done is they've put their political cartoons behind the paywall. Oh. Yes. So <laughs> Which, of course, is quite a big deal for their cartoonist because their cartoonist would previously be putting their stuff out on Twitter and, you know, it would be readily available. So n now there is, for a while anyway will just be seen by people who are paying a subscription to the Herald. Which is, a, it's kind of an unusual thing because, it, you know, it used to be newspapers, although a newspaper won't talk about its circulation, they they had this distinction. They talk about their circulation, but they also had their readership, and their readership was normally much higher than their actual circulation figures just because of the number of papers would be sitting in cafeterias, you know, cafes or around the place in libraries or past, you know, that there are multiple readers of a, a newspaper usually. Um, so you can see how that is going to impact political cartoons and for me it will be if stuff decides to follow suit with the paywall because everybody's watching what is happening, whether they're going to make any money out of doing this. So I'd be quite sad about that because the kind of political cartooning I do, I think of as a kind of quite often... Um, a form of activism, you know, like I am quite often talking about issues that I think are really important. Um, I don't just cartoon for laughs or for, you know, seeing where you can get the joke out of something. Or, um, occasionally I do that, but, um, yeah. So it, it is going to be a, an interesting time, especially now, for political cartooning. And because your cartoons often do seem to have quite a life on social media outside of just the newspaper itself, and I noticed recently a cartoon of yours even appeared on a billboard in Auckland outside a church. Mm. How did that happen? Um, oh, that was after the terrorist attack in Christchurch and a church in Auckland. I'm not very churchy myself, but... Um, they got in touch and said that they would like to use a cartoon that I'd done about the shootings, which was, it was the gentler end. I think there's one cartoon that's showing here that is um, a bit harsher around that um, that event, but this one was kind of a love, you know, hate, love, transformation thing, um, and they got in touch just to say could they reproduce it on the billboard, Um I, I should say one of the really good things that's happening in newspapers at the moment 
is considerably freer now for what you can publish in a newspaper. It was used to be there were a whole lot of things that were quite taboo that you couldn't... Well, partly because they'd be worried about the feedback they were going to get, you know, like how how harsh the criticism of what they were doing was, despite the fact that they would run people like Al Nisbet's cartoons. Um, on the other hand, they would have... I've, I've said this to someone before, but I remember doing... When I first started cartooning, I did a caricature of someone and the editor thought that the guy's nose looked like a penis. And, and I had only just started. And so she took it out into the newsroom and she was showing it around and she said... I haven't seen one in a while, but does <laughs> anyone think this looks like a penis? And I mean, kind of noses by their very nature are a bit phallic, and lots of people look at it and say, mm, yeah, I think, yeah, it does look like one. And then I couldn't have it published because it looked like a penis. Whereas more recently, I've done a cartoon about um, abortion, and I actually had a little dancing uterus and a penis with a scrotum so <laughs> talking and that went through and there was no issue at all. <laughs> so I was sort of, you know, achieved my dream in cartooning. Yeah. Truly, truly we live in an age of wonders. <laughs> so, M Mikhail, um, Sharon mentioned that she uh, still generally draws on paper but then scans it in. Um, you work entirely digitally now, don't you? Yes, uh, I work in the Matrix. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, um, due to the nature of my work and the deadlines and dealing with people on the other side of the world, uh, I've gone entirely digital uh, for the last six, seven years. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just easier, really, more convenient for me. And essentially, like my backpack that's over there, that's my studio. Um, so, like. I, I carry my studio with me everywhere I go, which is a good and bad thing. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. And I still like to do traditional work uh, for conventions and commissions, you know, keep those, uh, you know, flex those traditional muscles every now and then. But, um, but yeah, digital is kind of my thing now. Do you feel like it's changed the way you draw? Like, do you think it's changed the actual drawings themselves? Oh, yeah, I think, there, yeah, there is a... There is a difference between my digital work and my traditional work. Um, as much as I love digital stuff, um, there's the beauty in the in the brush pen and like the strokes, and then kind of getting you know, kind of the end of the stroke where you get like the the fuzziness. You know that 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 always looks amazing. You could have you have digital versions of that, but it just never feels the same. Um, so my work uh, digitally is more cleaner. Uh, than it is when I do traditional stuff because I like kind of getting that feathering uh, with some of the ink, the brush pens and stuff. Um, but yeah, but like I, I do love, I'm, I'm, I'm a slave to the line. Like I see things as uh, in line work rather than um, kind of hyper-realistic kind of thing. And so um, I found that digital has kind of uh, brought those strengths out in terms of line work, uh, really focusing on that. So yeah. And Roger, you've undergone a, a, a shift into digital drawing as well. Um, yeah, a bit. Um, I still, um, I like to. What I like to do is pencil traditionally, um, because without um, that tactile sensation, it's it somehow doesn't feel like real drawing. And I tend to get very. Um, I mean, paradoxically, dig digitally. Working digitally is supposed to free you up because you can make mistakes, but um, I find when I'm drawing from scratch digitally, I tend to be a lot more um, uptight about it for some reason. Um, so I try to mitigate the, um, the sort of uh, stiffness that I get when I'm drawing digitally by doing my original sketches just on paper and then scanning it and then sort of finishing it digitally. Um, uh, and that seems to be working all right. Um, I, fa I found it quite seductive, a, a bit of a trap, really, um, because, you know, th my plan was to just learn the digital skills so that I had some options, um, but it sort of made me more afraid of working traditionally because, you know, you can't fix your mistakes quite so easily, um, and once you put a line down, you commit, 
and that's a good thing, I think, because it does make the work more human if the mistakes are left in uh, to some degree. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, wean myself off working digitally entirely and, and do a few things traditionally just so I don't lose that because I think that's important just to just for the life of the work. I guess, it, I mean, it probably feels more natural to you maybe because you're from the 1980s? Yes, it could <laughs> be that, yeah. Um, it, it, I'm sort of the intermediary stage between uh, stone and chisel and uh, <laughs> graphics tablet. Well, the, 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 I think of the 1980s as the era of photocopy machines and Letratone. Yes, there was a lot of that about, yes. Yeah, I've still got stuff, Letratone stuck to bits of clothing. And, I yeah. still have Letratone. I've got in my, the bottom of my cupboard, I've still got sheets of Letratone. Yeah, yeah. And I've still got scars from the scalpel <laughs> that I used to cut it. You probably do yes. from the Wellington Media Collective. Yeah, and burns. I used to get burns from the the, um, the wax, the hot wax gun that we used to do layouts when I was doing stuff at Cricket. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't need to be a big nostalgia session. <laughs> <laughs> like Archaeology? What's this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> what is this wax gun? <laughs> the, <laughs> back when graphic novel meant Lady Chatterley's lover. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to ask you, all of you, um, do you feel that coming from New Zealand has shaped your work? It might be the way you draw or the way you tell stories or the kind of stories you tell. Um, let's start with Mikhail. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, whenever I go overseas, I'm proud to say I'm from New Zealand. I can't escape it because I'm brown and I talk funny. So, uh, but like, thanks to Thor Ragnarok, like, I'm a hit. Like, all I have to do, <laughs> yeah. I walk around and just go, piss off, ghost. But, um, yeah, um, but, but yeah, so like, uh, my first San Diego Comic Con, um, being from New Zealand, uh, was my point of difference. And for me, I'm, I'm big on being different, uh, standing out, uh, like this panel, one of these things does not belong here. Um, and, um, and so I used that as my point of difference because I knew that a lot of these creators, uh, a lot of these, uh, people working in comics, uh, see thousands and thousands of Americans in conventions all year round, but a brown guy who talks funny will stick out like a sore thumb. And so I've made a lot of friends, a lot of connections through that first uh, San Diego Comic Con because I was different, because I stood out. And um, building on top of that, um, I created a business card, which is a mini comic book, um, which again made me stick out. People were like, uh, were amazed at, at the idea and stuff. Um, yeah, well, it's, well, yeah, I, I do have some. So if you, if, if, I don't know if there's enough for everyone here, but uh, I, I will hand them out. But just little things like that. I'm always thinking about what makes me stand out, and being from New Zealand is part of that. But also, uh, I guess speaking locally, what makes me stand out in the New Zealand scene is the fact I'm Samoan. I'm Polynesian. Um, the New Zealand scene has pretty much mainly being a straight white dude's club. And I know when I, I came in to the scene and I wanted to make comics, um, the comics I love are like superhero ones, you know, very much the blockbuster um, mainstream comics. And I knew that didn't really fit well with a lot of the stuff being made in New Zealand. And so I, I also felt like an outsider in this outsider culture, which was a little weird. And um, I always felt like, at first, I never was really uh, embraced by the community. And uh, are we allowed to swear? <laughs> okay. Um, so I remember, I remember um, when I didn't feel welcomed by the majority of the New Zealand comic community, I went, fuck it. I'm going to let my work speak for itself. Um, so I just did the work. Um, but now, like, you know, like, I'm friends with a lot of the, you know, the community and stuff. I don't get invited too much. Like, how many how many comic fests have you done? And this is the first one I've done. Um, but um, but like I, I'm I'm part of the New Zealand comics community now. Um, and a lot of my work in the community is more about uh, sharing my story for other Polynesian kids who uh, who may be like me because there aren't many Polynesians doing this stuff, especially professionally. And um, and I don't want to be the only one, like so. A lot of my stuff uh, I do is focused on sharing my story, being uh, easily accessible, 
by kids like me. Uh, so they know that there's someone doing it. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I use my, not only my New Zealanders, uh, New Zealanders, but also uh, being Polynesian as well. Um, I I use those um, as my uh, my point of difference from everyone else, and that's what kind of makes me um, stand out. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because <laughs> most of the people who would look at my work are in New Zealand, so probably the fact of being a woman cartooning, you know, in editorial cartoons, that's obviously fairly unusual. There's, um, and I think it is internationally as well. There's, I have read that only two percent of political cartoonists are women. Um, and I can't even account for that. That's quite mysterious to me because there's lots of women drawing and there's lots of women who are interested in politics or social change. I mean, I'm kind of fascinated by what's happening in the UK. I watch some of the, the arguments going on over there between women who are doing political cartoons in the UK yeah. and the kind of, you know establishment people. There's some gallery owner there who runs a cartoon gallery and he's always arguing with the women cartoonists. Won't show them and it's, yeah. yeah. I don't know the details but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of some it. of the people who are um, yeah, affected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that some of those people have become very angry and have been marginalised, you know, like to the point that they've left papers that they work for or... Um, or lost work there, you know. Um, but I suppose my my identity in New Zealand is around doing, being a woman and drawing cartoons, so it is going to be from a female perspective. Um, I obviously have other sympathies as well, but, you know, yeah, so I just am New Zealand, you know. Sharon Murdoch, she is New Zealand. I am New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've lived pretty much my entire adult life outside New Zealand, um, so it's, it's probably less obvious in my work, but it, it definitely creeps through, and sometimes not always intentionally. Um, uh, and in particular, the perspective of a New Zealander who doesn't live in New Zealand as an expat. Um, when I was writing for the Mighty Avenger for Marvel Comics, um, Thor's situation in that comic was essentially that of an ex expat. He was exiled from Asgard and living on Earth. Um, and uh, I, I did a story where um, his Asgardian friends showed up and took him out to the pub for a drink. And it, it's very much like, you know, my 20s. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it creeps in. I mean, whatever you do, your own experience creeps in, re regardless of whether you intend it to or not. It's um, inevitable, I think. Is when you're doing creative work, your experiences are what you draw on, um, uh, even if it's a bleak. Yeah, one of my favourite moments is uh, from the Muppets comic when they're trying to figure out what Gonzo is, and on the list is Poo Kiko, and I'm like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I marked. That's one for that. the home team, <laughs> man. <laughs> I saw that. I was like, yes, that's awesome, a Poo Kiko. <laughs> Um, I think we probably have reached the time where we should start taking questions from you folks. So uh, we do have a couple of roving microphones, and if you can wait till the microphone reaches you, because uh, it's being recorded, like everything else we say in front of our phones these days. That's true. I live in the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> we all live in the Matrix. I tried not to embarrass my kids here. So, but anyway. I'm just wondering, for many wannabe professional cartoonists in the future, basically you say make a living out of being cartoonists, what in your own experience of finding or say deciding um, your own style is the biggest mistake or easiest trap for them, uh, for them to uh, avoid either from your own experience or from your observation, if I may ask. Who wants to start? Um, well, do you, have you got? 
Mikael. So you, you're asking about like uh, how they find their own style and what? Um, maybe more like uh, what's the biggest mistake or is this trap they could fall in and you would like them, you maybe the advice say, don't ever do this. <laughs> what should <Okay>. you not do? <laughs> I was going to talk about the style stuff, but um, yeah, like a lot of a lot of young aspiring artists that come up to me like, ah, oh, I'm trying to find my style, like, you know, how do I find my style? And I think with every other question, uh, it's the same answer. It's draw more, um, because drawing is such an it's like an active form of meditation. You uh, when you're drawing, you get to explore your own mind, and in doing so, you get to know yourself a bit more. So the more drawing you do, the more you find your voice as an artist. And that's why I found through my experience. That's how it feels for me, because um, I yeah getting to know myself through drawing because I'm exploring my own mind. And so in terms of finding your own style, you just got to draw more, and there will come to a point where you're just like, this is me. Like this art style is who I am as an artist. But that only comes with more drawing. There's no, unfortunately, there's no uh, no magic trick, no uh, super top secret. It's just effort and work, really. Oh yes, copying is is part and parcel of your experience as as an artist. You know, you you start off by imitating what you love and stuff and through doing so you get to learn bits and pieces um and then it gets to the point again it's that journey so you start off by copying but then once you start drawing more you get a bit more confidence so you start drawing your own stuff and then the more you draw your own stuff the more you find your voice as an artist so it's all a journey um and for artists um like a lot of people like and they kind of see artists as other artists as competition but um the world is so wide and diverse now that your voice as an artist, there's there's a place for it. Uh, we're all on the same journey. We're just running different tracks. Um, no one's in your way. And uh, the internet has opened up that diverse voice. Um, for you, know, you have a story to tell, you've got an opportunity to tell it. Sharon, Roger, did you have anything to add to that? Well, in terms of things to avoid, um, uh, I, I suppose the biggest mistake a lot of uh, cartoonists make is only learning from other comics. Um, it's it's really it's certainly been very useful for me to to have other other things to draw on um, to bring into my comics. Um, I'm I'm a fan of sort of radio of old films, um, things I read, um, real life. Obviously, I mean, actually doing some research about the real world. Um, bring other things that aren't just comics into into the work. That's probably the most important thing because there are, I think, an awful lot of people who just, you know, copy the comics they love and their comics look like somebody else's comics for the rest of their life. Do you have anything to add, Sharon? I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the, the process of drawing as... Um, I'm always lashing myself about thinking, oh, my God, I've got no style. Like, no style at all. And then I... Um, and then, actually, that is my style. No, <laughs> no style. But it's... Um, I think, like, anyone here who draws will be really familiar with the experience of doing a very rough drawing and then trying to do a finished version of it and it just dies. Um and so one of my, if it's a tip at all about drawing, for, from my perspective, when we were talking about process before, about you know whether you did it or drawing um, by hand, is I've, I have a weird reverse process where I do a very rough biro drawing in a sketchbook that I nearly always have with me, and it's like really rough. And then I photocopy it and I blow it up to the size I normally work. Then I do pencil drawings over the top of it and um, 
And if it's a political cartoon, I nearly always do it with a dip pen. And the reason I use a dip pen is I am never in control of it. So it's, it's like all these unpredictable things happen when I'm using it. And then I think, oh, thank God, that doesn't look like my drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be my tip. <laughs> use some device that you're not quite in control of. <laughs> so then after I've done my pen drawing, then I scan it and then I piss around with it for ages. Well, as much as you can when you're on a deadline. And, you know, like I'm always on a deadline for the next day's paper, so I have this four o'clock deadline in the afternoon. So it's a state of panic as this is happening. But anyhow, I, I think being not quite in control for me. You were talking about that before, about the quality of a line and the things that happen with your drawing instrument. They, they're the most delightful things in drawing. And probably not to give yourself too hard a time about it. I think style actually comes of its own, you know, like a, a, your own genuine style. It, it develops of its own over time, and when I think of all the cartoonists that I know here, they all have very distinctive, like very distinctive looks. Yeah, you, know, you could recognise any of them, couldn't you? It's weird, isn't it? It's like we're all drawing, but they look very different. Yes. Um, I'm really interested in the power of imagination through especially longer um, pieces where you get someone taking history like Toby doing um, Te Tiriti o Waitangi and in even telling that story ask questions about well what should be happening now and I look at The Simpsons and see President Trump forecast and wonder how much did that actually get people in a state where subconsciously they almost expected it. Um, and, and we're saying, you know, science fiction, it's, it's like used to be, oh, 20 years in the future. Now it's less than two years from idea to realisation. So when you're creating your sort of works, do you ever sort of think about, okay, is there a message? Is there something I'm trying to sort of just, oh, this is a nice two, this is a dreadful, this is a, you know, like that, connecting it with the culture and the almost educational impact? The, the part of that question about Trump was the most terrifying question I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, well, just another thing, sort of what like... What are we going to make happen with our imagined stories? And I'll just anchor it back. When you're talking about the history of cartooning, the very first ones, of course, were the cave paintings about people imagining the results of a successful hunt. So, you know. I guess uh, talking about cultural stuff... Um, I have illustrated uh, the Samoan heroes, Tongan heroes, and Cook Islands heroes books. Um, and one of the things I loved about working on those books is that those are tales that aren't being told. Um, as a kid who loves superheroes, I absolutely love mythology. But the myths and legends we learned about at school were either Māori, Greek, or Roman. They weren't really about the other Polynesian islands. So as a New Zealand-born Samoan, not only did I get to illustrate the legends of Samoa, I also got to learn the stories. And I've seen those books and libraries and schools absolutely tattered and it's the best because it means there's kids reading that stuff and I understood that because I was one of those kids and so I understand the cultural impact of that stuff um, speaking of Toby's uh, Treaty of Waitangi um, comic I just finished doing a comic for uh, Lift Education about the Polynesian Panthers um, so written by Samoan playwright Victor Roger um, illustrated by myself and we I found it really interesting because there's a Dawn Raid exhibition up in Auckland which is amazing and I thought it was interesting that the schools were actually approaching the subject because this is recent history but there's a whole bunch of kids who don't know about it like this is in their parents lifetime and they don't understand how bad it was in the 70s I was born in the 80s um, but like I understood those uh, those occurrences so now there's all these kids who will be reading about this stuff and to have a Samoan playwright and a Samoan illustrator telling that story again has a cultural impact um, so yeah so that's kind of the stuff I do about when, when it comes to comics my stuff's mainstream um, uh, so it's, it's, I'm not about philosophical comics and stuff I'm just about telling stories and um and my stories happen to involve men in tights grappling each other. 
Um, but uh, but that's also my life. Um, so um, so yeah. So swings and roundabouts. It's just like yeah. It's just it's just a constant cycle. I suppose mostly of what, of what I do is hoping that there's going to be some, you know, it's going to be the another little drop in a, you know, a social change. Um, I do try, like, like in Toby's comics, I quite often will include some information. So, like, I think normal traditional political cartooning was the joke or the... I mean, yeah, making making a political point, but it wasn't around a educational, you know, um, any more information than the person already had. Whereas I would quite often use bits of quotes, bits of information. Quite often, the the speech that I will use will be direct quotes. Where if you shift the context slightly, you know, you use that quote, but you shift the context, it reveals it for something either sillier or nastier or whatever it was, you know. Um, but I would say, like Toby, I would have uh, in mind what I wanted it, you know, what I wanted it to create, as opposed to, I think, say, I, I know I mentioned him before and I don't mean to give him a hard time because I do know him, um, but our Nesbitt's cartoons, which reinforce a really, like, terrible ideas and I think give people who read it permission to keep thinking those things, you know, that it's a validation when they see it. They think, oh, yeah, okay, like, you know, there's someone thinks like I do. So there's no challenge in it. Um, it, it feels to me kind of ugly and lazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I, yeah, I don't, I've never, I haven't thought about anything you've said um, before, really. Um, I, I suppose. From my perspective, I do a lot of stuff for children, and um, in terms of the effect that that has on the world, um, I hope, I mean, my intention is that it will have a positive effect on them. Um, uh, it will show sort of strong friendships and, and how to be good people and things like that. And I suppose in terms of a social effect, that's that's... Is it? Where I'm at with what I do, um, but in, yeah, in terms of bigger issues, I, 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 I don't know. If if I, if I thought my my work could change the world in that way, I'd probably, um, you know, be far more ambitious about that sort of thing. But I'm not sure it does. I think it's just a drop in the ocean, really. Well, I think uh, we'll just take one last question because we're almost on five o'clock. So our last question. Hi. Do you have any advice for any younger people trying to break into the world of comics and cartooning and how to get their stuff out there? If that makes sense. Um, the, the thing I always tell people when they ask me that question is just make sure that you do as much work as possible and make, it s make sure it's seen by as many people as possible. Um, and whether that means publishing your own comic or um, putting it on the internet and making a big noise about it and making sure as many people see it as possible. Um, but that's that's everything that every job I've ever had has been because I've done something off my um, on my own and made sure that people saw it. And then, you know, people who actually had the ability to pay me for it would come to me on the strength of that. I don't know any other way of, of, of uh, breaking in, really, um, apart from doing the work and then making sure people know about it. Yeah, I, I just got to reiterate that do the work. That's, uh, there's no shortcuts. There's no, uh, there's easier ways to get your work out there, but you've got to put the work in. Um, yeah, it's, that's there's no substitute for doing the work. Um, again, with a lot of aspiring artists, they're like, "Oh yeah, I want to get into comics," or like you're the same with wrestlers. Oh, I want to be in the WWE because oh yeah, have you been to the gym? Have you done any training? Have you drawn your comics? Oh no, because well, they <laughs> go and do the work. Like you know, too many people are, are saying what they want to do but not backing up with the work. And so, the best way to get good at 
drawing comics is by drawing comics um, and finishing it. Finish your shit, okay? <laughs> young, young, young artists, finish, finish your shit because once you finish something, you can stand back and take a look at what you did right, what you did wrong. I've seen so many young artists with unfinished stuff and it's still stuck in that, um, that, that maybe it'll be perfect state and then maybe I won't ruin it. Um, they, they go nowhere. They plateau. Um, but once you finish your stuff, you learn so much just by completing something. And also by completing something. See, I was terrible at assignments at high school, but I wish I was better at them because freelance work is assignments that you get paid for. So, uh, so now I finish my shit. So, um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, finish your stuff. Like that's you learn so much just by completing your work. Um, so yeah, so that's another kind of thing. Do the work and finish it. So yeah. Sharon, do you, you advice for people? That is such good advice. Do <laughs> do what they say, and I'm going to do. <laughs> On, on that note, note, we will now finish our shit. And <laughs> Monty will wrap up for us. I've just, I've just got some last shit to ca cover. Trust the brown guys. Mikael, um, w w we've loved having you here, and I will definitely invite you to the next Comic Fest as well. <laughs> Thank you for, for staying <laughs> Standing in for the drawing demo and doing all the amazing stuff you've done today. It's been wonderful to have you all here. Um, thanks to all the staff, all the hard work we've put in over the last um, six months. And I will just hand out these bags and say thanks to everyone, thanks to the sponsors, and thanks for attending another great comic fest. Yeah. <laughs>